The committee will come to order. Mr. Kucinich? I, think I have a point of order, Mr. Chairman. Please state your point of order. Uh, under uh, Rule 11, Clause B, the use of the committee broadcast system shall be fair and nonpartisan. And my point of order is that uh, since uh, the majority has signs up behind uh, Mr. Cummings, which uh, reflect your point of view and not ours. And since this is being broadcast, and you can see the signs behind Mr. Cummings, uh, that it would be fine, you know, it's fine with me, and I'm sure our side, if you want to put all your signs over there that reflect your point of view, but by having them up behind Mr. Cummings, it's actually taking a partisan, uh, uh, assigning to him a partisan position since the signs right behind him. And, and, I'm, and therefore, my point of order relates to um, uh, Rule 11, Clause B. Okay. No, noting broadcast. your point of order, the, the Chair is prepared to rule. Within the committee rules, it is a, the signs and other areas of this, this uh, room are within the discretion of the Chair and are not appealable. However, the gentleman's point relative to broadcast will be evaluated for broadcast appropriateness. The sign is not within the scope of the gentleman's uh, point of order and thus is not appealable. However, we will evaluate in consultation with the ranking member as to broadcast procedures, which th this doesn't affect, but which we certainly want to make sure that we stay within the point of order that you raised, which is, again, not within the scope of that sign. However, uh, we certainly would like to have a review of broadcast procedures to see if there are any uh, concerns by the Chair as to broadcast. With that, we would begin based on another discretion so, of the Mr. Chair. Mr. Chairman, did, did you sustain my point of order then? Or? No, actually, uh, since it is within the discretion of the Chair, it is not subject to a point of order, uh, and we would be glad to give you the, the line that shows that it is a discretion. Well, I, I, hope you, I hope you are able to work it out, because uh, you know, it seems to me that we have a violation of that rule. Thank you. Thank you. And I thank all of you for, here today for your patience. Uh, this is a time in which the Committee has been preempted by the discussion of funding of the government, and nothing uh, ultimately can be of more importance to the American people to, uh, than whether or not our troops in harm's way continue to be funded after Friday. With that is the discretion and policy of the Chair that we begin by uh, reading our Oversight Committee mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get for, from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Government Oversight and Reform Committee. Today's hearing is on the United States Postal Service, where publicly traded uh, oh, sorry, today's hearing is on the United States Post Office and the new contract. Were the Post Office a publicly traded company, it would be among the 30 largest in America, having revenues of $70 billion. Its 30 plus thousand post offices exceeds that of Starbucks and McDonald's combined. Over the years, the Post Office has gone from a growing and thriving industry able to sustain positive cash flow and effectively positive profits. That is now in our taillights. Today, members of the active workforce enjoy approximately $11,000 worth of legacy burden into their pay, meaning that when the Post Office looks at its cost of doing business, it, in fact, has legacy costs that very much resemble General Motors before its bankruptcy. The Post Office cannot and will not renege on its promises 
to those already retired. We cannot and will not renege on the obligation that we have to the American people, both under the Constitution and under hundreds of years of tradition of the Post Office. Every day, six days a week, the American people expect that a letter will be delivered directly to their box in front of their house, down the street, or often in a chute in their door. The contract negotiated, not yet ratified, is, in, is intended to allow the continuation of a history of collective bargaining, but compromises sufficient to allow the Post Office to emerge from what is at best a break-even and, by some estimations, a five-and-a-half-plus billion-dollar loss, and to get to a positive position able to meet all of its obligation, both present and legacy cost, in the foreseeable future. This contract falls short of that, that goal. It is very clear the intention is good. The Postmaster has worked diligently to get some concessions. However, we will hear today that we, in fact, under current law, may not be able to negotiate the contract that needs to be negotiated. Additionally, from this position on the dais, we have deep concerns that some of the provisions of the contract might, in fact, be the wrong direction, toward less flexibility, less ability to trim the workforce, and less ability to make the kind of investments in the future that we need to make. Having said that, this committee stands ready to make legislative changes that may be needed in order to secure for the Post Office the kind of abilities to reinvent itself it needs. Additionally, this committee in the past on a bipartisan basis has been willing to delay uh, certain uh, required deposits in order to allow the Post Office time to regroup. At the same time, the hundreds of thousands of letter carriers and postal workers deserve to have a level of certainty that allows them to plan their future, a future in which the Post Office is able to deliver efficiently a product in a reasonable cost and, in fact, meet its obligations. To that extent, we intend to hear from all the, care, all the participants that we can over a period of time. Today, we have four. But I assure you, both at the full committee and the subcommittee, we will, uh, we will be hearing many, many, many more. And with that, I recognize the ranking member for his opening statement. I want to thank the chairman for yielding and for this hearing. Ladies and gentlemen, the United States Postal Service is the Nation's premier mail delivery service, providing universal service to the American people at fair and reasonable rates. Last year, the Postal Service delivered nearly 40 percent of the world's mail, serving 150 million United States residences, businesses, and post office boxes. Although the Postal Service generated more than $67 billion in revenue last year, it faced serious financial challenges recently. Since 2007, its revenues have declined because of reductions in mail volume, increasing energy prices, and the recent downturn in the United States economy. The Postal Service reported losses of $5.1 billion in 2007, $2.8 billion in 2008, $3.8 billion in 2009, and $8.5 billion in 2010. I am encouraged that the Postal Service is taking significant and serious steps to address these challenges. Last year, the Postal Service issued a new 10-year strategic business plan that improves productivity cuts costs in operations, uses more cost-effective retail channels, and consolidates administrative functions. With new leadership in place, we are beginning to witness the emergence of a smaller, smarter, and more nimble organization that is reinventing itself to become more competitive in an evolving marketplace. With this in mind, there are some key points I would like to emphasize. First, the Postal Service pays salaries that are comparable to the private sector. A recent review found that the Postal Service letter carriers received a standing starting salary that was slightly more than FedEx carriers and slightly less than UPS drivers, both on an initial per hour basis and after several years of service. 
I might note that behind me is a chart that says that 80 percent of the Postal Service uh, uh, money goes into employees. Uh, and it is interesting that this very committee, Mr. Chairman, 87 percent of our uh, uh, money goes in for personnel expenses. Second, the Postal Service has been aggressively reducing its workforce. The current workforce is the smallest in 20 years, employing nearly 100,000 fewer workers than in 2008. Since 2000, the Postal uh, Service has reduced its workforce by nearly 27 percent. Let me say that again, 27 percent. And it plans to continue reductions through attrition and by extending its current hiring freeze. Third, the Postal Service is actively examining additional proposals to further reduce costs. For example, GAO recently recommended a host of cost-cutting measures, including a legislative proposal to modify the Postal Service's mandated requirement to pre-fund retiree health benefits. Currently, the Postal Service is the only Federal uh, entity required to uh, pre-fund retiree health benefits, and these costs are expected to average, ladies and gentlemen, $5.5 billion annually through fiscal year 2016. Mr. Chairman, as we discuss these proposals today, I would like to offer a note of caution. More than 200,000 members of the American Postal Workers Union are in the midst of voting on a tentative labor agreement concluded with the Postal Service on March 14, 2011. This agreement would institute a two-year freeze, a two-year freeze on wages and cost of living adjustments, and it is projected to save approximately $1.7 billion. It would allow the Postal Service to reduce the starting salary of postal clerks even further from $40,800 to $35,300, and it would implement one of, of the recommendations made by GAO by allowing, allowing greater use of non-career and part-time employees. While it is appropriate for this committee to conduct oversight of the Postal Service, we must be very, very sensitive uh, to criticism that we are using, today, using today's hearing to improperly shape the outcome of the impending vote. Both management and the union have negotiated in good faith, and we should allow workers to consider this tentative agreement without undue congressional intervention. Finally, Mr. Chairman, I would like to thank uh, all the postal employees for their dedication and for their hard work. For the sixth consecutive year, the Postal Service, above all other government agencies, continues to be named as the most trusted and reliable government agency by the American people. That is a hell of a compliment. The Postal Service is also one of the largest employers of veterans in our country, with approximately 22 percent or about 114,000 employees, veterans, having previously served in the United States Armed Forces. Moreover, approximately 40,000 of these employees are disabled veterans. I feel strongly that our committee should focus not only on stemming recent losses at the Postal Service, but on pursuing options to create a healthy and profitable Postal Service for the future. And a key component of this new organization must be a reasonable, and livable wage for these devoted and trustworthy public servants. Once again, I say to every single member of the post office community, we thank you for what you do every day, rain or shine, delivering our mail, uh, dogs biting you, rain, sleet, hail. We thank you over and over again. And may God bless you. And with that, I yield back. I thank the ranking member. By previous agreement, we will now recognize the ranking, chairman, or ranking subcommittee, or the subcommittee chairman and the subcommittee ranking member. Mr. Ross, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, thank you for this hearing. Today, the committee will hear from the Postmaster General and two of the presidentially appointed Board of Governors who will attempt to lay out their vision for a substantial postal work, substantive postal workforce and describe how the APW contract fits into that vision. This will be the first time in a decade that multiple USPS governors will appear together at a congressional hearing. We know that the Postal Service is one of the largest organizations and employers out there. It has more than a, a, a half a million employees, and that exceeds all of U.S. companies except for Walmart. It has a phenomenal marketing and delivery infrastructure where it goes to every consumer or it goes to 150 million consumers every day. Unfortunately, due to the ongoing digital revolution, the business model of the Postal Service is fundamentally broken. 
It is losing billions of dollars every year and now stands on the brink of insolvency. This is not just a short-term problem, as the Postal Service projects growing deficits for the foreseeable future. It is incumbent upon the USPS to develop and implement a new business model as soon as possible. I commend Mr. Donahoe for what he has done his commitment to implement a comprehensive strategy that will reduce costs by undertaking major organizational restructuring, reviewing post office closures, and adjusting delivering, delivery frequency. I hope we can empower you to do more. At 80 cents on every dollar, workforce costs make up a disproportionate share of po postal service costs. These costs must be addressed head on as part of any serious reform effort. Among these costs are a large postal compensation premium that has been estimated at 34 percent. In fact, in 2001, uh, arbitration decision, neutral arbitrator Stephen Goldberg stated, quote, in concluding that there exists a postal service wage premium, I join a long list of arbitrators in prior UP USPS interest arbitrations who have reached the same conclusion, close quote. Regrettably, the tentative U contract USPS recently announced with its largest union, which represents over 200,000 employees, maintains and expands no layoff protections guarantees wage increases and ensures that USPS employees continue to pay a lower portion of health care premiums than do other Federal employees. USPS claims the contract will save them $3.8 billion over its four-and-a-half-year life, but I am skeptical of that. However, as this chart shows, assuming that all these savings are achieved, it hardly makes a dent in projected USPS deficits. Given this, it is unclear how this deal, which would serve as a template for deals with other USPS unions, will give USPS the ability to immediately reduce workforce costs and maintain solvency. One of the Board of Governors testifying today is James Miller, who is a former head of OMB. In contrast to other USPS executives, Miller has expressed disappointment with the APW contract and only endorsed it as the best possible under a broken arbitration system. In a paper Mr. Miller concluded, included with his testimony today, he also outlined options for reforming postal collective bargaining and noted econometric, uh, econometric analysis has found USPS employees are paid a significant premium relative to their private sector counterparts. I look forward to hearing from Governor Miller and the rest of the witnesses. I would like to thank the Chairman again for this hearing, and I do yield back. I thank the uh, Chairman. And with that, we recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Lynch, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the witnesses for helping the committee with its work. A little over a month ago, the Subcommittee on the Federal Workforce, Postal Service and the District of Columbia held a hearing on the financial condition of the Postal Service, and the news at the time, as, as most of you know, was less than encouraging, although it was a bit better than what we saw last fiscal year. At the conclusion of this year's first quarter, the Postal Service had a net loss of $329 million compared to a net loss of $297 million for the same period in fiscal year 2010. However, if you exclude the cost of prefunding future retiree health care benefits, as the ranking member has pointed out, uh, a burden that no other agency or private business in America is required to carry and you add the non-cash adjustment to the Postal Service's workers' compensation liability, the Postal Service would have actually ended the first quarter with a net income of $226 million, a gain of, of $226 million. Further, over the past couple of years, we have witnessed the Postal Service and its employees work to improve efficiencies and reduce costs by over $10 billion. Since 2008, the size of the Postal Service workforce has decreased by over 100,000 employees, which is probably, probably why many observers uh, point out that the Postal Service actually stands as a model for the rest of the Federal Government in terms of lowering costs and right-sizing its workforce and, and network. The tentative agreement re recently reached between the Postal Service and the American Postal Workers Union is the latest example of postal management and its employees working together to ensure the future viability of an entity that serves as a cornerstone of a trillion-dollar industry and supports over 7.5 million private sector American jobs. However, let us be clear that there are certain aspects of the Postal Service's compensation and benefit costs that are out of the organization's control. Specifically, I am referring to the hardwired health care benefit payment schedule that forces the Postal Service to prefund future liability at an overly aggressive rate, again, a requirement that no other agency or company uh, in America must shoulder. On top of its prepayment obligation, the Postal Service is also subject to, to Federal employee pen 
pension rules and guidelines which have resulted in the potential overpayment of both its civil service retirement system and its Federal employee retirement system. So in, in answer to the question, are postal workforce costs sustainable, which is the subject of this committee, the answer, I guess, is it depends. It depends if we believe in universal service. It depends if we believe in a re reliable manner of delivering the mails. It depends if, uh, if cost to the consumer will be reasonable. And it depends on whether or not this country still respects its workers and is willing to treat them with basic dignity. For this reason, I, along with Congressman Cummings and other Democratic members of the committee, have introduced H.R. 1351, the United States Postal Service Pension Obligation Recalculation and Restoration Act of 2011. H.R. 1351 directs the Office of Personnel Management to update the actuarial, the actuarial methodology to be used in calculating CSRS retirement benefit liabilities between the United States Postal Service and the Federal Government in accordance with modern actuarial practices and accounting standards. Any resulting surplus from the recalculation would then be transferred over to the Postal Service Retiree Health Benefit Fund. Lastly, H.R. 1351 would require that the Postal Service's already agreed upon FERS surplus of nearly $7 billion also be refunded immediately by applying the following, $5.5 billion towards the Postal Service's fiscal year 2011 retiree health benefit payment, $1.2 billion towards the Postal Service upcoming workers' compensation payment, and any remaining balance toward paying down the Postal Service debt. Since it is the job of this committee to find ways to help ensure the Postal Service remains a valued and viable entity well into the future, I urge all of my colleagues to consider co-sponsoring this fiscally responsible legislation. That said, I look forward to a constructive and honest discussion on this important topic, and I thank all of the witnesses for coming and providing their input in this, this morning's hearing. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. All members will have seven, or seven business days to submit opening statements and extraneous material for the record. Without objection, so ordered. We now recognize our distinguished panel of witnesses. The Honorable Louis J. Giuliano. Giuliano, very good. I don't want to mess that one up. Right. Uh, is the chairman of the United States Postal Service Board of Governors. The Honorable James C. Miller III is a member of the Board of Governors of the United States Postal Service. Mr. Patrick Donahoe is the Postmaster General and Chief Executive Officer of the United States Postal Service and a frequent visitor. And Mr. Cliff Guffey is President of the American Postal Workers Union and critical to today's hearing. Pursuant to the committee rules, all witnesses are required to be sworn. Would you please rise to take the oath? My script says to tell you to raise your right hand, but that usually goes without saying. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you, will, you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, but nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Would the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative? Please be seated. <clears throat> Gentlemen, in order to uh, allow time for hopefully everyone on the dais to ask you a series of questions, we would ask that your entire statements be placed in the record. Uh, in some cases, you may choose to work off of them, but if you choose to use your five minutes for other material, you would be well served because then you will have your cake and submit it too. Uh, with that, please try to summarize during the yellow light uh, appearing in front of you and conclude as quickly as you can when it goes to red. During the question and answer session, because we have a large gathering today, I will have a fairly quick gavel. What that really means is if someone is still answering questions until a few seconds before uh, the end of the time, I may say that you have to give a very short answer. Uh, not anything more than a yes or no or our reply for the record. On the other hand, if you were in the process of making an answer, no matter how long, as long as it is necessary, I will allow you to, con to continue until you have completed your answer. So that incentivizes people up here 
to quit, quit talking in time for you to have a full and complete answer. Additionally, if somebody would like to also answer a question after the time has expired, it will be the general policy to allow one additional person to comment afterwards. I hope that allows us to average six or seven minutes on a five-minute per member basis, which is about as tight as we can hold it and be fair to both you and to the members. So with that, Chairman, you are recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. <clears throat> as we have talked about, my name is Lou Giuliano, and I serve as Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Postal Service. This is my first opportunity to testify before you, and I thank you for the privilege. The Board shares the concerns expressed by members of the committee about the financial losses at the Postal Service. We also appreciate the fact that some in Congress are concerned about our labor costs, and in particular, the tentative contract that has been negotiated with the American Postal Workers Union. For these reasons, we feel today's hearing is critically important, and the Board of Governors applauds your willingness to explore these issues in depth. The tentative contract with the APWU is the best that was achievable under the existing law. Failure to reach a negotiated agreement places us in binding arbitration, an outcome that, Mr. Chairman, we, we believe would not have allowed us to realize most of the benefits that we did uh, gain in this contract negotiation. This is especially true as it pertains to f flexibility of the workforce. The tentative agreement provides the Postal Service with three important things immediate cost control, a flexible workforce, and long-term structural change. The Board unanimously supports the tentative agreement, which will produce a cost savings of $3.8 billion during its life. We believe that both labor and management have demonstrated their determination to right this ship in these negotiations. We also appreciate the fact that uh, we urge the committee to consider other actions that are necessary to protect the financial viability of this important American institution. On the top of this list is the Retiree Health Care Benefit Prepayment Program. First, let me be clear. We have been and will continue to pay our fair share of health care costs for our employees and retirees. But the $5.5 billion of accelerated payments for future retirees, many of which who have not ever even been hired, mandated in the 2006 PAEA, are an extraordinary burden that no other organization, neither public nor private, is required to make. They constitute a hidden tax that is neither fair nor responsible. We have been repeatedly told that our prepayments for future retiree health care benefits is a scoring issue. During the last four years, from 2007 to 2010, we had total net losses of $20 billion. This would have been a total profit of $1 billion had we not paid and expensed $21 billion of retiree health care benefits. Instead of owing $12 billion today, we would have $9 billion in the bank. Only Congress can correct this problem, and I believe it is in everyone's interest to do so. If action is not taken to address the situation immediately, the Postal Service will default on, on our payments on or before September 30th of this year. Despite the overpayment of almost $7 billion, we continue to have to pay $3 billion per year into the FERS system. We are told that only a change in the law can fix that. The workers' compensation regulations that we work under are cumbersome, unfair, and costly. We have liabilities that no other company that I am aware of or organization would have. Workmen's compensation represents a $12 billion liability to the Postal Service, and it cost us over $1 billion in cash last year. We ask you to consider the legislation that has been introduced in the Senate to address this issue. It is a government-wide problem. We also require action to create a more flexible delivery schedule. We would prefer not to have to go to a five-day delivery schedule. But when considering the alternatives, we consider it the best. It is the only way and a significant way to help offset the decline of first-class mail. Management has demonstrated the ability to drive significant improvements in its processes. 
and reduce the size of the postal workforce while improving service levels and adding new delivery points every year. The tentative labor agreement negotiated with the APWU is a solid step to reducing labor costs. We are hopeful that we will achieve further flexibility in our negotiations with our other three unions. We are eager to work with Congress to effectively resolve these and other major issues. It is my hope that it is by working together we can enable this venerable institution to reshape itself to meet the future needs of the American public and leave a legacy about which we can all be proud. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Governor Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Oops. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I am Jim Miller, and I am responding to your invitation to uh, testify today. Uh, chairman Giuliano speaks for the Board. He is Chairman of the Board. And to the extent that my, the views I express differ in any way from those that Governor Giuliano expresses or expressed by uh, Postmaster General Donahoe, please, please list those as my own personal views, and, don't, and they shouldn't be attributed to any other governor or, or to the Postal Service management. While I am on the subject of the Board of Governors, I wish to emphasize that it works in a very collegial fashion. There are four Democrats right now and four Republicans appointed by President George W. Bush and President Barack, or President Barack Obama. But we work in a very nonpartisan way, and we work very, very hard. Now, thank you for holding this hearing, as Governor Giuliano outlined and, other mem and members of the um, Congress have outlined, the U.S. Postal Service is in dire financial uh, shape. Without some miracle, as Governor Giuliano pointed out, we will default. We will be insolvent and default on September 30th. We will default on the debts that we owe the United States at that, United States government at that point. And I respectfully uh, submit that only you can avoid that fate. I have submitted, as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, uh, or Mr. Ross, or, uh, Chairman Ross uh, mentioned that I have submitted a state, short statement and an attached paper. Let me just say that what I, the point I make in that paper and in my statement is, as Chairman Ross said, the, the current model for the Postal Service is broken. It is inapplicable. You have a demand that is shrinking. You have the high profit mail, first class mail, shrinking. And there just isn't the opportunity to earn those kinds of profits on the high class mail to subsidize all of the other things that we have done. To survive, the Postal Service needs systemic reform. Financial relief, in my judgment, is not enough. We need systemic reform. We need freedom to operate as a commercial enterprise. Now, I realize that there are some misgivings have been expressed about the latest APWU agreement. My response is that we did the best we could under existing law. Our current system, from all the evidence that we have in times that we went to compulsory arbitration, is that the system is biased in favor of labor and against management. The unions know this. And we know this. And so in our decision to accept the best we could get with our negotiations or go to arbitration, we had to keep this in mind. And so we accepted this agreement as the best we could get, deal we could get. And I respectfully submit, Congressman, members of the committee, that if you want a better deal, you have to change the law. Mr. Chairman, thank you for inviting me here today. I look forward to responding to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Mr. Donahoe. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. It is an honor to be here today to testify about the tentative agreement between the Postal Service and the APWU. I appreciate the invitation to testify about such an important development for the Postal Service. For the past several years, the Postal Service has been responding to an unprecedented 20 percent decline in mail volume. We have been extremely aggressive in managing costs throughout this period. Since 2008, we have reduced 
110,000 employees and $11 billion in costs. We recently announced a reduction of an additional 7,500 managerial positions, a 35 percent reduction in that group since 2008. Our full-time career complement today is 572,000 employees. We will continue to reduce the number of full-time career employees, thereby reducing our legacy costs. By 2020, the Postal Service workforce will be less than 400,000 people. Through process improvement and personnel reductions, we have taken the necessary steps to bring costs in line with declining revenue, and we will continue to do so. More than eight months ago, the negotiating team began bargaining to shape the labor contract for 202,000 career employees. The parties negotiated long and hard and dealt responsibly with tough issues. We sought and we were able to achieve greater workforce flexibility, immediate financial benefit, and long-term structural changes. One of the most important aspects of the tentative agreement is that it provides significant workforce flexibility. We will be able to schedule our employees in ways that make sense for a variable workflow business and we will be able to increase the use of non-career employees. I would like to impress upon this committee that neither side was willing to take the easy way out or simply roll the dice and leave our respective fates to a third-party arbitrator. We need the flexibility to properly schedule our workforce, and we achieved that. Interest arbitration is not going to result in flexibility gains of this magnitude. This tentative agreement also provides for immediate financial benefit by freezing wages for the first two years and leads to a wage savings of $1.8 billion over the term of the agreement. We negotiated structural changes that result in a two-tier pay schedule for new employees that is 10.2 percent below existing schedules. We also will be able to increase the use of non-career employees from the 5.9 percent today with restrictions to a totally unrestricted, roughly 20 percent. These changes provide a benefit of $1.9 billion. I look forward to negotiating with our other three unions to gain similar results. While it is the nature of negotiations that neither side got everything that they want, I will tell you it is the best possible outcome that we could have achieved given the legal framework of which we operate. This is a responsible agreement. America needs a healthy postal service and a healthy mailing industry. And although we have seen declines in the use of mail, the mail and physical delivery are extremely important and always will be. Mr. Chairman, while this morning we are discussing our tentative agreement with the APWU, it is important to recognize that our labor agreements are but one element in a larger strategy to return the Postal Service to profitability. Let me assure you I am doing everything possible to take costs out of this system as quickly as possible, and I will continue to do so. Our business model is inflexible. We need reform in the laws that govern us. We must get beyond the mandates that require us to pre-fund retiree health benefits, to overfund our Federal employee retirement system and to deliver mail six days a week. Congress plays an important role in our future. The Postal Service is reducing costs, and we want to work with Congress to gain the business model flexibility that we need to best serve our customers. Let me close by stating the Postal Service has achieved record service and productivity levels over the past few years while absorbing significant volume loss. The credit belongs to our employees. I will never forget for one moment that we are able to deliver for America, and that is due to the commitment and relentless dedication of our employees. We are in the process of changing many things about the Postal Service to better serve the American public. This contract and your commitment to continued engagement in postal issues will help us meet their changing needs. I would be more than happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, the Chair would note that uh, you have added one very good uh, member of your team sitting behind you that we, we all recognize as a leader on this issue, Mr. Strong. Yes, and we are pleased to have him. Thank you. Ron, next time you get up and testify, we will get you sworn <laughs> in. Mr. Guffey is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I am Cliff Guffey, President of the American Postal Workers Union. Postal workers are very proud of the fact that we provide an essential service to the American people. We have faced many challenges over the past decade as a result of the severe economic recession and a decline of first-class mail. From 2008 to 2010, the postal workforce was cut by approximately 110,000 jobs. Thousands of workers represented by the APW were reassigned to jobs far from their homes and families. 
This resulted in severe hardships for these workers and their families. Despite all this disruption and all this hardship, postal workers' productivity has increased and on-time service to the American public has remained at excellent levels. APW approached the labor negotiations that prompted these hearings with one primary test in mind, what will be right for the employees we represent, the Postal Service, and the American people it serves. It is a testament of the value of collective bargaining that the APW and the Postal Service have reached a tentative agreement that meets this test. It gives the Postal Service an opportunity to return to postal employees work that has been contracted out to save money doing it. Under this agreement, the APW will compete aggressively to return work to bargaining unit employees, work that is being performed at a greater cost by contractors and, in some instances, by higher paid non bargaining unit employees. The tentative agreement also protects the livelihoods of the people APW represents, people who have dedicated their working lives to provide postal services to the public. Postal employment has been and continues to be an important source of middle class employment opportunities. The Postal Service employs more than 129,000 veterans in its career workforce. In 2010, these veterans were 22 percent of the postal career workforce. 49,000 of these veterans are disabled veterans, and 13,000 of them, including me, are rated as 30 percent or more disabled. In 2010, women were approximately 40 percent of our workforce, and minorities were approximately 40 percent of the workforce. I am proud of the fact that this tentative agreement protects the livelihoods of these and all career postal workers. A review of these negotiations of postal history will show that since the passage of the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970, postal wages have closely tracked inflation. Meanwhile, postal service productivity, including labor productivity, has consistently increased. As a result, as a result postal ratepayers have benefited from excellent service at low postage rates. Since 1970, postage rates have not gone up any faster than the prices in the economy generally. If this committee wants to help the trillion dollar per year mailing industry, it should relieve the Postal Service of the burden of pre-funding retiree health benefits and correct the overfunding of CRSR and FERS. But for the unique and unreasonable and unnecessary requirement to pre-fund the retiree health benefits, the Postal Service would have had a substantial financial surplus over the past four years instead of a substantial deficit. No one could expect postal employees or postal ratepayers to shoulder the cost of paying billions of dollars into a Federal trust fund unnecessarily. That is a problem that requires a legislative solution. I would like to add that here we, the Congress is again holding hearings on the symptoms of the problem holding hearings on Social Security, which is a symptom of the problem, holding hearings on unemployed veterans is a symptom of the problem. The problem in this country is the economy, the economy, an economy that sets up trillions and trillions of dollars to be shipped overseas, while in America, on our side of the ledger, we have more unemployment, underemployment, lowering wages, and, and uh, people losing their homes and mortgages. We have problems, uh, our national deficit, trillions of dollars for people overseas and trillions of dollars of deficit here. You correct the problems in the economy and the Postal Service will take care of itself. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Now I recognize myself for five minutes for a round of questioning. Uh, Mr. Giuliano, uh, you, uh, you said several times uh, things along the line in your opening statement of, no company would have to bear this. Isn't it true that a company would have to, under law, fully fund its, its liabilities in real cash transfers uh, for a defined benefits program? Isn't, isn't the pension law one in which you must pay in advance every day for what you eventually will pay out for uh, in, in retirement and in uh, health care, if that is part of your benefits plan? The big difference in this case, Congressman, is that we, no company that I am aware of would be required to pay for future retiree health care. Okay. Well, maybe we will go to Governor Miller. Isn't it true that every company that has a defined benefit plan does have to pay for future retirees, not future employees, which you said, which we will look into, but General Motors, I can recall taking a, I, don't know, I think it was $5.5 billion hit one time by a change in accounting rules that caused them to have to recognize more into their defined benefits plan. And ultimately, by the time they went into bankruptcy, 
that was their greatest cost differential between themselves and the Japanese, was having to pay into these defined benefit plans. Would you like to comment on that? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. To my knowledge, your characterization is accurate. So maybe the question here today for this committee, which also oversees FERS and so on, is shouldn't every government entity have to fully recognize, at least on paper, the legacy costs they are creating today with employees who will retire in the future? Is there anyone that disagrees with at least accounting for that? I understand your concern is paying for it, but does anyone disagree with the accounting of knowing what the future costs are going to be? Well, let me, let me ask I, it. Yes, do, Mr. Chairman, um, I think you make an important point. We are a commercial enterprise, so we have a bottom line. Most government agencies are not, so it would be an accounting entry. But to have Congress and everyone else recognize that government agencies, other government agencies, have these liabilities would be a good idea. Well, I think, and I think, I think that is something this committee needs to look at broadly, is, is the truth in accounting of what our legacy costs would be. Mr. Donahoe? If I could comment, too, Mr. Chairman, um, I think there is a couple of things we have to look at here. Number one, when you look at the entire retirement uh, liabilities that the Postal Service has, uh, we feel that we are overfunded into the Civil Service uh, Retirement Fund. I know Mr. Lynch has got a bill coming up to ask the, the uh, GAO and the, uh, uh, and the White House to go back and look at those, those accounts. Somewhere right. between uh, 50 and $75 billion from our estimates and two separate uh, Mr. Actuaries. Donahoe, uh, the question for you, since the administration, Sorry. I understand, has already rejected the argument. You are asking them to go back and relook at something they have already rejected. Yeah, yes, sir. Okay. Yes, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I think uh, it was Einstein that said that if you keep doing the same thing over and over again, effect, expecting a different result, that is the definition of insanity. Let me, uh, let me take my limited time and go on with just a couple of more things. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if but, I— No, no, uh, please. Uh, uh, there will be plenty of time for follow-ups. But, Mr. Donahoe, you said, and Mr. Miller said, and I think Mr. Giuliano said, that this was the best you could do under existing law. Isn't it true that in binding arbitration, two provisions could not have happened? The provision for insourcing janitorial services that Mr. Guffey referred to as, you know, outsourced at a greater cost, I, and I object to it being a greater cost. If it is, then we need to address that. But that could never have been achieved except through this agreement the insourcing. That, that was not, in fact, a part of the collective bargaining. It became part because it was put on the table. Also, in the case of a change from a statutory approved category of people that were not eligible to be under collective bargaining to this new category who most assuredly will become eligible under collective bargaining, as I understand it, the provision that you negotiated creates an absolute requirement. If you don't join the union, you lose out on $3,000 of free benefit. So isn't it effectively that this new category of, of workers that is, was estimated to be 35000 at the end of one year immediately costs us at least 3000 more before you do a pay raise, so that by year three, our estimation is th this group will cost you more, not less. Mr. Donahoe, would you want to comment yes, on that, I'd, Mr. I'd Miller? I'd like to comment on uh, a couple of things. First of all, uh, we set out in this agreement to, to achieve three basic uh, strategies. No, 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 I appreciate all of that, and, and you will get plenty of time on that. But one, isn't it true those two items could not have been done by, the, by mandatory arbitration? They couldn't have ordered those two changes. In mandatory arbitration, it is a roll of the dice. We maintain Okay, Mr. This. Miller, would you disagree with that? In arbitration, could those have been on the table? They weren't part of the collective bargaining agreement. Could they have become part, essentially mandating new union employees in a new category? Mr. Chairman, I am not an attorney, but my understanding is that if a uh, provision was part of the package that the union was advancing, the arbitrator could take these items and include it in the, uh, in the final determination. But it's, historically, arbitration is about the pay and benefit of those covered, not those not covered. So the likelihood, in, at least in, from the advice I am getting, is that there are two things which increase the number of Mr. Guffey's union workers, and that is that you are substantially insourcing 4,000 people who previously were just contract employees to clean and, and do other janitorial work, and this category that now will most assuredly be added to the union and undoubtedly be in the next bargaining contract asking to be treated fairly and equally with their brothers. Mr. Donahoe, if you could answer briefly. Uh, first, first off, it is important to note that we 
maintained all outsourcing provisions in the contract going forward. What we looked at in the case of the custodial employees was the financial benefit to bring the work back into the Postal Service with the newly negotiated substantially lower wage rates. We did that with everything we looked at from an insourcing standpoint. We compared costs like we do with everything. Uh, we always keep our eye on the bottom line. Okay. And my time has expired. I want to be thoughtful of that. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much. Um, you know, it is very interesting when you look at the fact that um, since 2008, there have been a reduction of 100,000 employees. That is a lot of people. That is a lot of families. And, um, you know, I, as I listen to what has been going on this morning, you know, sometimes, you know, you can begin to cut to the bone. At some point, you begin to cut through the bone. Last year, the Government Accountability Office released a detailed report on options and strategies that could potentially improve the Postal Service's future financial viability. A significant portion of the study focused on reducing the Postal Service's compensation and benefits costs. For example, the GAO study recommended creating a two-tiered system that would pay new hires lower wages, while grandfathering current employees under the existing pay system. Mr. Donahoe, how does the uh, tentative labor agreement reach between the Postal Service and the APW carry out uh, that recommendation? Thank you, Mr. Cummings. We, we have um, uh, two things that we have been able to reach agreement with with the APWU in terms of flexibility and structural change. The first is uh, we have been able to negotiate a percentage of each of the crafts represented by the APWU. Twenty percent of the clerk craft, uh, which is the largest portion of the APWU, will now be non-career flexible employees. We have 10 percent in a motor vehicle and 10 percent in maintenance. So that is one large structural change, as you have noted, with the, the GAO study. The second thing we have been able to do is negotiate a, an entry wage rate of 10.2 percent less that never changes. It is a two-tier wage rate going on from now until a person retires from the Postal Service, again, giving us an opportunity for financial relief and flexibility going forward. So you mean that, that new person coming in will, will make 10 percent going through? Forever. 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 And um, what impact will that have on the postal system? I'm just curious. Well, from the a, last piece there. The last piece. The last piece. What we what we were concerned about was long-term structural change. In a, in the short term, in the next three or four years, we will continue to hire very few career employees. But when you get out to 2016 through 2020 and out beyond that, as you hire career employees, you will be able to save that differential. GAO, GAO also recommended greater use of non-career or part-time employees going forward in order to reduce the Postal Service's compensation related expenses. The Postal Service's 10-year strategic plan made similar recommendations. What steps has the postal system taken to accomplish this goal? And I remind you that this committee itself, this committee, 87 percent of our uh, money goes to employees. Uh, you are at 80 percent. Are you trying to reduce that further? Well, what we do, what being uh, the labor-intensive organization we are, we constantly look to shrink the pie. So you will always be higher from a percentage standpoint. The idea is you are trying to shrink the total cost. And we have accomplished that through a number of ways, the productivity Im improvements that uh, people have noted, headcount reductions, as well as this negotiation. Going forward from a flexibility perspective, I mentioned the percentages before that we have been able to work out with the APWU. The other big change is the fact that within our regular employment structure, we are working with the APW to provide flexible assignments. Currently, you have a number of people that will work five days a week, eight hours a day on the same schedule. Our needs change daily. We have been able to work out an agreement with the APW that provides flexibility, work hours anywhere between 30 to 48 a week with changing hours daily. Mm -hmm. That meets our customers' needs. President Guffey, uh, um if ratified, the tentative contract you negotiated will bring the new APWU career hires in at a much lower pay scale. What does this new pay system say about the Postal Service and the APWU's commitment to reducing compensation? Because you know, we keep hearing uh, people banging on public employees, and it seems to me that this is going a long way. People are literally uh, making l less money. I know that there has been there's a freeze. Is that right, Mr. Donahoe? 
For two years? Yes, sir. Is that right? So, I mean, I'm just wondering, you uh, representing your union, I just want to know how, you know, what, what does that say about your union? Uh, first, I would like to correct one thing that was, uh, sure. Mr. Ice had said. He said that they would have to join the union to get this health insurance. Our health insurance plan that we are providing to the non-career people is a, is a nonprofit plan that is uh, low cost. And no one will have to join the APWU to get the benefit of that plan. In other words, the parties decided that was a, I, I insisted that these new people would have to have insurance, and so we would provide them the lowest cost. But we cannot require these employees to join the union to get that insurance. Uh, having, you know, this part of your uh, follow-up answer, as a labor organization, we uh, have no uh, desire to uh, destroy the uh, company that we work for. Uh, we entered into these negotiations knowing that the Postal Service was under dire financial strait by the uh, uh, prefunding requirements and that we would have to work our way through it. And in doing so, we wanted to ensure the, ensure the future. Now, and some of the other corrections are that we, we discussed in flexibility uh, the old work rules that were five within eight. Uh, that may not allow the Postal Service to keep windows open, say, to six, seven o'clock. And, and by doing so, uh, turning away customers. So we allowed them to do this without uh, overtime. A lot of other issues. Thank you. I see my time has expired. It is called shared sacrifice. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mack, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, for one, uh, like the placement of your signs and hope that uh, members on the other side, if you don't like the signs, then maybe help us craft solutions to change the signs. Um, last month, Mr. Donahue, last month when uh, you were here testifying, you acknowledged labor costs as a large contributing factor to the Postal Service budget problems and that your number one priority were, was to address these costs. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, so since your last visit, what steps have you taken to reduce the amount, 80 cents on every dollar that the USPS spends on labor costs? As we have been talking here today, Congressman, we, uh, one of the uh, things that we have focused on going forward is our, is our um, overall comprehensive plan, which addressed labor costs, among many other things. We have worked through a very good agreement with the APW to reduce labor costs in a four-and-a-half-year period at a minimum of $3.8 billion. Since the let last me, let, time me, let me ask you a question, yes, sorry, and I will let you yes, continue sir. on it. But, uh, so um, this is the best deal that you could have struck under current law. Yes, sir. Um, and, but now you are saying that it is, a good, it is a good deal. So regardless of the current law, this, you think this is a good deal? This is the best deal that we could struck under the current law. We think it allows the Postal Service to continue to reduce labor costs while, produ but while giving us the opportunity to increase flexibility. That was our goal going into these negotiations. If the law was changed, could you uh, consider would you consider a better deal? I will tell you, if you would change the law, I would love to see you address retiree health benefits, my FERS overpayments, and our delivery flexibility. That is where the big money is. Uh, in your negotiations with the American Postal Workers Union, is it true that you extended your policy not to lay off workers with six years of experience and also guarantee that there would be any, there wouldn't be any layoffs for an additional 7,000 workers? Yes, we did. And I will tell you why we did that. We, that was my next when, question. When, oh, I will <laughs> tell you why we did that. Um, when our goal in this negotiation was worker flex, workforce flexibility, immediate cost reduction, and structural change. We know that you don't get that through a, an arbitrated decision. So we originally approached the APWU at the very beginning and talked about layoff clause, and I will leave Mr. Guffey to provide his side of the story. But we got the immediate uh, feedback that there, that was a no non-starter. So our feeling was we wanted to go ahead and get a, a negotiated contract that achieved our goals. The other thing that you have to keep in mind, when you throw things into arbitration, you lose time. It could have taken us a year and a half. And the money that we were able to negotiate out of these labor costs would have been delayed per perhaps a year and a half, and we would have so, never got the same kind of a deal that we got through negotiation. So uh, I heard as the panel, uh, as all of you uh, in your testimony, uh, continue to say the best deal you could get under current law. What have you asked the committee uh, for changes to current law so you can strike a better deal with the unions? There have been recommendations made in the in, past. In writing to the committee? No, no, sir, we have not. Well, if you are going to come here before the committee and say 
we need changes to the law so we can strike a better deal, then maybe you ought to submit what those are to the committee in writing so we can have a, a discussion about what those changes are. We will submit those along with the other recommendations to relieve the Postal Service of the mandates that are really causing this problem. Thank so you. if you are going to default uh, September 30th, why is it taking this so, so long to ask for uh, changes to the law so you can strike a better deal? We have been asking for changes to the law for the past few years, Congressman, and will continue. But never, but never in writing to the committee. We will follow up in writing with you. No, no, not to me, to the entire committee. To the chairman. Thank yes, you. that would be, that we'll would be helpful. Um, so the, la the last question is, I guess, so I just got a you know, nice little um, article in my, uh, on my iPhone here talking about a post office that is going to be closed in, uh, on Vanderbilt Beach Road in my district. Um, so wouldn't it be better that um, negotiations with the unions would take place in such a way that people wouldn't lose their jobs, uh, but we were able to get some of the costs under, under control? I would like to uh, answer that question. Here is what we are looking at from a, 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 a Postal Service access and convenience standpoint, and that is what we are focusing on. Uh, there are many different ways that you can provide access to the American public. What we have to do as part of our financial responsibilities that we have laid out in our comprehensive plan is look at how much money we spend to provide that access. When you read about closing a post office, what we are proposing to do is take a good look at each community where we don't have enough revenue I, coming in and, and, I perhaps, and perhaps I understand provide that, that service but, in another But for way. the unions themselves, I mean, it sounds like the union, heads of the union would rather um, see people lose their jobs than to renegotiate contracts. Part of, part of the NCE, the, the lower cost employee that we have talked about, would help us to maintain post office operations. What we are looking at is much smaller places where you don't even have any union employees, where you are looking at trading off, say, a postmaster for a contract at a local store, where we can provide better access at a lower cost. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. With that, we recognize the former chairman of the full committee, Mr. Towns, for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you for uh, having uh, this hearing. Um, and also let me just sort of commend the uh, Postal Service for the outstanding job that they have done under these adverse conditions. And let me tell you that they are uh, definitely adverse, and no doubt about it. And to think about the fact that you have already eliminated 100,000 positions since 2008, I mean, that within itself. Let me begin by saying, uh, asking, I guess, you, uh, uh, Mr. Miller, in your written testimony, you mentioned that the Postal Service has taken steps to strengthen its revenue base by offering more services and acquiring more clients. You also mentioned providing services in response to customers and entering into partnership with other service providers. I am very interested in the concept of offering different services other than mail delivery as a means of creating a strong revenue source. Like every other large private entity, the Postal Service needs to adapt to the change in times in order to remain financially uh, and viable uh, in the future. We know that the uh, Postal Service um, already takes passport applications. I would like to see this expanded to other things. Uh, could you give us some examples of additional services that can be provided that would result in a reliable income stream for the Postal Service? Mr. Chairman, thank you for raising that. When I wrote that, I had in mind the mailing services, the new mailing services that we have uh, uh, initiated. You know, for example, the box that you see advertised on television a lot, it doesn't matter how much it weighs, if it fits, it ships, <clears throat> things of this click and ship, things of uh, this nature. I think what you are talking about are products that are ancillary to our business. Right. I, I think uh, my own personal view, as long as we have the monopoly on mail, I would be careful about going beyond that. And as an economic proposition, I would be careful about going too far. Uh, for example, there have been people that suggest that we get in the banking industry, I just, banking business. I think that's, that would be disaster. Um, but on the other hand, some things that you were hinting on, uh, like the, post, the passports and things of this nature, I think there are other opportunities that we have 
uh, that perhaps do not fit within the current legislative definition of permissible services that might be considered? And I would I'd have to discuss that with my colleagues, but I mm -hmm. think that there might be an opportunity for us to consider that and get back to you in writing, Mr. Chairman. Right. And let me just say this, too, um, um, in that hearings like this is to sort of get information, get ideas, and to see how we can work together. It is not about whether you send us a letter already or not. It is about what you need to send to be able to move forward from this point on. So I don't want to get mixed up here. I want to make certain that we stay focused on what we really need to focus on. So on that point, Mr. Donahue, what is it that we can do here on this side that you think that needs to be done in order to help you to become viable? The, the, the key issue is to address the congressional mandates around the retiree health benefits, to address the overpayment of FERS, and to, to allow us the delivery flexibility. Those are the key things for us going forward. I will say this. We have been very responsible stewards of this organization. We take very seriously our requirements for the American public for service and, and our requirements for the American public to provide efficient service. Just, it, just what the uh, chairman said, the, uh, one of the visions of your committee. So we take that seriously. What we, are, what we need is your help on these big issues that are beyond our control. We have excellent employees. We have got excellent working relationships with our four unions and our three management associations. We know how to get things done. The things that we can't control are the mandates, the $5.5 billion in the retiree health benefits. Get those things out of the way, and you will never see us again. All you hear about is accolades about how good of an organization the U.S. Postal Service is providing service to the American public. Well, let me say this. I think you are serious about it because you hired one of our best in terms of uh, <laughs> we know that. Ron Stroman. So uh, I think you are committed. On that note, Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield back unless there is somebody that disagrees with the fact that there should be uh, additional service or you should not think about additional services. If anybody disagree with that, then I would like for you to just respond very quickly. I think that, uh, to, to the Chairman's point, he mentioned all the facilities that we have got out there. There is plenty of opportunities in our lobbies to provide services for other people to come in. Uh, we are exploring those. There are definitely opportunities. We know there is still a ton of value in the mail, and, and I guarantee you we will work on that. Thank you. Thank you. We now recognize the Chairman of the Transportation Committee and a, a longtime member of this committee. Senior. Senior? senior? senior. Now, you are too young to be senior. Mr. Micah, for five minutes. That is just uh, using a lot of just for men, so um, <laughs> look that one. <clears throat> I don't know if uh, our witnesses noticed, but the, the group that has been feeding dinosaurs uh, from the House of Representatives is, uh, is no longer here. And uh, unfortunately, it looks like the post office is. Uh, uh, somewhat uh, becoming a dinosaur. Uh, it's not your fault, you know. Everybody's got one of these, and uh, you get most of your messages. I just, I didn't send any letters to my nieces and nephews today. I, I <coughs> sent them an email. I, I noticed you, from what I read and heard, uh, what I was sitting in the back. Uh, You've got 572,000 employees, and it should be down to 400,000 uh, just to deal with the kind of traffic that you have now. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you have a. Uh, I didn't see a specific plan on how you get rid of 172,000. I saw the average cost is 89,845 per employee today. Uh, you did mention how you get rid of some of the costs for the 572, but that still doesn't help the math. The other thing, um, you are $6 billion in the hole this time, right? Yes, sir. And I understand, I asked, well, how are you financing that? And they said you got sort of a line of credit with Treasury for $15 billion. That runs out in September. What is going to happen in September when, when we stop feeding the dinosaur? We well, don't pay you. Well, Pardon? We don't pay the Federal Government all that it is due. So just default? Yes. We will deliver the mail, the Postal Service. Speaking of delivering the mail, <clears throat> uh, Saturday and Tuesday, is that all off the 
No, we are still very interested in working which, which with Congress. Which is it going to be? It would be Saturday. That's, that, a, that's the best day. But that, uh, we've been talking about these things. We talk about them. Uh, some years ago, I, I had the opportunity. Actually, I went down to the post office. I think uh, I forget who the postmaster general was. I mean, he just about we had to buy, just about buy him depends at the time because he'd never seen a member of Congress in his office. But I was stunned by the vacant um, uh, the va vacant uh, desks, and they took me around, and showed me how many people they got rid of. Usually, if you look at some of the overhead, now you got a lot of postal people on the ground, and people do have to do a good job, and they do a good job in delivering. But sometimes you can get rid of the administrative overhead. Do you have a specific plan for doing away with that? Yes, sir. We have been how very many, How very many focused. have you got in the administrative positions? We have been very focused on that. We've, we have administratively about 15,000 people, and that includes everybody from uh, operations to uh, How many have we got payroll. in Washington, D.C.? Uh, uh, about 1,100. We just are going through a process reduction here right now, sir. We are reducing 20 percent. So I could come down and see a lot more empty desks? In, I will tell you this. You will see empty buildings. In the past two years, we have taken mm -hmm. four buildings, eliminated the leases, moved them into the building we're in now, and we're downsizing. Well, that's the again. big picture on the local level. And you know, you you, get, you hear from members. I've tried not to contact you on some consolidations or sure. take a position because you got to do your thing, and it's tough. Uh, hundreds of people show up at these things, but maybe uh, I don't know if you could sit down with members or others that are close to the the subject. I, I can give you examples. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to. I've got. A, a post office in St. Augustine, Florida. I've been trying for eight years to get you out of a congested corridor where you can't move traffic, where you, it's, it's expensive to operate. Just the traffic backup and trying to get in and out just doesn't make sense. But I don't have time. I used to be a real estate developer. I could put a deal together in no time. But you ought to have some people. The, I, my observation is the post office doesn't initiate anything on the local level to bring about cost-effective changes. I could put you in a retail center. I got tons of vacant space. But some, somebody has to have the brains to put this together. I've tried peripherally, and I don't have time to, to, to cut these deals. We did one in Deland, Florida years ago, yep. and that was a huge success. I'm it revitalized the whole center and yep. the, that side of town. Yeah, I've, the, got, I've, I've got Daytona Beach. Here's another example. I've gone from uh, 1,100 bureaucrats in Washington and 15,000 down to smaller projects. Daytona Beach, you've got a post office that's a beautiful site in downtown, and it's had the second floor vacant. I tried to get some folks in there, uh, talk to people about doing something with it, and it sits vacant. So, um, you know, we produced in our committee a report ca called The Federal Government Must Stop Sitting on Its Assets. I don't think we had a, ch uh, a chapter in there for you, but maybe we could write one. I would be more than happy to come over and sit down and walk through all the buildings that we've sold, vacated land deals we've got. We've got a couple of great ones going on. Mr. Lynch up in Boston, we're talking with some opportunities right now. We've got a lot of those well, things done, I, and I'm, I I'm open you. to any other suggestions you have. Well, I applaud you. And the big one's fine. We yep. need to and have a, uh, a better handle on getting rid of excess property, yep. excess space, excess employees. Yep. And um, uh, last thing would be buyouts. Um, What's the status of buyouts? We do have an op option on the table for some of the people that uh, we're working through right now with the downsizing, and the buyout provision would be uh, twenty thousand dollars that would be paid over a two-year period. So that spreads our cash out. For how many? Uh, we we have the offer up to eight thousand people. We don't think anywhere near that will take it. Okay, we, you're still I, about one hundred and sixty thousand short. Thank you. I thank the gentleman and. I might note that you probably haven't heard in your committee about their sales because they get to keep the money uh, unique to the post office that they sell and internally use those dollars. With that, we recognize the distinguished gentleman from the metropolis of Cleveland, Mr. Kucinich. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. In listening to this discussion, what, uh, what strikes me <clears throat> is that I haven't heard the people who are in charge of managing the uh, post office about the moral obligation that you have to those who delivered the mail for 20, 30 years or more with respect to their 
full health benefits and their um, full retirement benefits. And if people are retired and they put all that time in, for the life of me, I don't understand why they should have to go begging to the government to assure that all the things that they worked a lifetime for are going to be there. I keep hearing this theme. I had steel workers in my office the other day tell me that now they have got to deal with the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, they are going to be lucky if they get 40 percent of their retirement benefits. See, see what is happening here is, by the way, Mr. Donahue, you, I, uh, is it your goal to see the Postal Service privatized eventually? Is that uh, what No, it is not my goal. Do, my, do, goal my goal is to provide excellent service. Uh, okay. Let me ask you some questions. Sure. Okay. Are you, have you met with people uh, uh, concerning a broader privatization of postal service functions? Have you had any meetings about I, that? I have not. Have, have you or any, anybody else, any of the governors, uh, Mr. Giuliano? Congressman, as part of uh, approximately two years ago when we started looking at all the alternatives that we put into our comprehensive plan, we looked at all the alternatives. One of those was privatization. Another part of it was other types of products. The okay, conclusion I, I, that's, that's all I wanted. I, I just wanted to see if, if, if somebody had some meetings and talked about privatization, because I think what is going on here is that uh, there is actually an attack on this very idea of universal service. Because once you privatize, then you can legitimatize knocking down wages and benefits, cutting services. Look, it has already started. I don't know about any of you, but in my, in my neighborhood you have seen post boxes taken out of neighborhoods. Then you see branches closed. I have seen private delivery service boxes outside of branches. What is that about? Um, you are operating with 100,000 less employees, <clears throat> so your jobs are cut, wages aren't moving up, and the burden here in these discussions seems to keep focusing on, on the workers. I like that Mr. Um, Towns raised the question about trying to find ways of bringing some income in to assure the Postal Service. But, but the, the, the tone of these hearings, uh, characterizing this service as something that is so much in the past that it is that a dinosaur. Um, really belies the fact that millions of Americans rely on this as a service. You might be able to communicate by email, but not everyone does. We understand there is a huge social divide in America in terms of people who use the Internet to communicate and those who do not. And you know, we, we want everyone working together, have to do that. I am glad to see you are negotiating. And, you do, and from what I see, it sounds like it is in good faith and you are trying to solve within the context of the system. But, um, Mr. Guffey, are, are, you, are you concerned that, that these um, these kind of present, these kind of talks, these kind of uh, hearings, could be trying to set the stage for a privatization, broader privatization of the postal service. Could, could you could you speak into the mic and turn your mic on? I, I believe it's uh, leading to an attack on the labor movement as a whole. Just as the workers in Wisconsin, the firemen, the uh, uh, teachers, and, and the police, and the, and the state troopers are being attacked in those states. Uh, but what about the Postal Service? Same in the Postal Service. I believe that is what is happening. I would like to say there is great opportunities. You know, the, the Post Office is where the flag flies in every little community across this country. Opportunities for putting in other government services into the Post Office is, is, is there. 
uh, doing the TSA work, the verification work that TSA could do, could be done in the local post offices. Could you give this, this committee, uh, through the Chair, of course, the ideas that uh, you presented that can expand the revenue <clears throat> of the Postal Service? Could you do that? Sure. And I just want to add this in my uh, 15 seconds that are left. You are right about this broad attack on, on workers, but it is also an attack on the public sphere. If you look at the Michigan bill, it sets the state for broad privatization of everything that is uh, uh, owned by the public. People pay for it once and they end up paying for it again through privatization. And inevitably, the cost of the service goes up, quality of the service goes down. I thank you. I yield back my time.